much, and welcome everyone to my talk about Kotlin DSLs. So the first question, obviously, is what are DSLs? And we have seen a fairly good, ex <coughs> some fairly good examples of DSLs already today. So they are domain-specific languages, and as such, it's important uh, that we have a domain there, a meaningful concept, and that we have a language to express the concepts of this domain. Um, and when we talk about a domain, I'm not talking about the business domain in general. It can be for a business domain, but in general, it's for smaller parts of your code. They are specific to certain kind of problems, like for example, Android notifications or routing uh, web pages, for example. There are two types of DSLs, and we have seen both already today. Um, the first is external DSLs, and that is what was their uh, first uh, SQL. SQL is one example, and GraphQL that we have seen would be another example of an external DSL, and you can use any language to parse this DSL um, and to uh, implement it. <coughs> Internal DSLs, on the other hand, are specific to a host language, so in our case, of course, to Kotlin, and they are actually Kotlin. They are normal Kotlin code, they make um, use of normal Kotlin concepts, and as such, you can also use normal Kotlin code within your DSL, and we have already seen this today as well. So uh, I will give you a few examples, even though we have seen already some of those. <coughs> The first is from Kotlin Test, which is a library that allows us uh, to test code in Kotlin. And um, they, um, the concept for them is very important, that your test should be the specification of, of your code. And for this, they have, uh, for example, the should spec. They have other kinds of uh, testing styles as well. And um, you use it like what you see here. Uh, you have a should method. And within it, in the Lambda, you're do doing something. And then at the end of your method, you're doing some assertions. And those also more or less read like a normal language. So a name should start with something, or it should end with something, and a map should contain something. So those are your assertions. Normally, you wouldn't do those in the same method. But for now, just for this sample, I've put them in there as well. So. Um, you already see here one important characteristic of DSLs. They allow us to easily read and understand what is happening here. The second example is by COIN, or is using COIN. Uh, COIN is a dependency injection library. Uh, someone today has already mentioned it. And um, <coughs> this snippet shows you how to define those de dependencies. How do you define the beans? So every bean in there is a dependency that can be reused within your code. Whenever you need a bean of this certain type, you use this. And when you need a new class of a certain type, every time you have a factory. So as long as you understand the concepts bean and factory, you can read this code easily and understand what is going on there. And you also see that at the top, there is this well db glash some database get instance. Um, this is normal Kotlin code. It has nothing to do with a DSL. It's just preparing something so that you can create the DAO later on. The final example that I want you to, to show you to uh, get a better feeling about DSLs is uh, from Enco. Enco is a library that is uh, helpful for Android development. And one part of Enco is creating UIs by code. And um, in this case, uh, it's a simple layout, you, uh, a simple yeah, UI. You have just one constraint layout. Within this constraint layout, you have a text view. And you can see at the bottom part that this text view is attached to the top left corner of uh, the screen if you have left, uh, right to left, no, left to right languages. So again, easily readable. And within this uh, connect uh, part at the bottom, you again have something that more or less reads like uh, a sentence. So these are the important parts, and that is why I uh, 
actually care about DSLs is that they are easily readable. They make the intention of your code obvious. So when your colleague uh, has to deal with your code because you're sitting here at a nice conference and has to bring out a new feature today and uh, has to see your code, and if it's a DSL, it's easily understandable and easily uh, maintainable. So, um, and if the colleague uh, we are talking about is just yourself a week later on, um, it's even easier understanding a DSL than uh, some other API usages. usages. So a DSL is just a part of your API. So if you have uh, multiple modules in your code or uh, if you create a library, you might want to create a DSL and this DSL is then part of your API. And as such, normal mm, rules for API design apply to DSL design as well. First, whenever you design an uh, API or a DSL, there are two things to consider. The first is you are the provider. You are writing the code so that some other can use your DSL. And the other side, obviously, is the consumer or the client of your DSL that you have defined. And when designing an API, you should always focus on the client. You should always have the client in mind. Don't deal uh, or don't expose the problems that you have. So we have seen um, uh, some libraries today that deal with this nicely. For example, even though it was no uh, DSL, it was nicely designed API, Apollo um, hit all the details of how to access this uh, remote server, pass the GraphQL, and give you back an object. It was all hidden behind a few method calls and some initial definitions where you set up the builder and so on. So that was nicely designed, and you should try to uh, do so as well. Um, if there are technical problems, the client doesn't, is not interested in that. If you're doing Android image, uh, if you want to do a DSL for Android image loading, for example, um, also uh, the client isn't interested in how you achieve the HTTP call, whether the response by the server is chunked or not. It's something that is a detail, an implementation detail, and how to implement that, you should hide the, all this from the client. Um, the important thing here is, are those last two sentences, sentences. The usage of your DSL or your overall API should be as easy as possible. And the misuse of your library, of your DSL, or whatever you expose should be as hard as possible. Strive to achieve that. Um, even if you strive to do that, <coughs> you will fail. Everyone fails. Uh, one glaring example of someone who failed uh, is the Java API. We already had a sniping remark about the calendar API in uh, the Java world. They failed with the first attempt in Java 1.0. They failed with the second attempt, which was the introduction of calendar, uh, calendar class and so on in Java 1.1. And about 20 years later, they finally fixed it with the daytime API, which is finally usable. It took them quite a long time, and because they are so slow, we are sitting today here, and some other one picked it up and created Kotlin for us. Um, an important question when creating APIs is, of course, whether you should or whether you can introduce breaking changes. Mm. And it kind of depends. So um, features that you have made public, or you cannot take back features that you have made public, because your client is using your library maybe just because this feature is in there. And if you take the feature in a later version out, the client is totally broken, and there is no way to rewrite the code um, so to get this feature back. Renaming and stuff like that, in my opinion, is no problem. Just follow the normal uh, semantic API versioning, give it a uh, new um, number, a f new first number, so that you indicate to the client that it's a breaking change and everything is fine. 
be very careful. In my opinion, you should be very careful with that, but not as careful as the Java guys were. So um, <coughs> a design aspect specific to DSLs is um, that you must choose a syntax. So how um, is the client supposed to use the concepts you're dealing with? And um, you should also <coughs> deal with the stuff like how, are data, how is data passed in, when is data passed in, um, should this DSL be run whenever something is used or is it just to create an object graph, for example. And you should use the nouns and verbs carefully. First, try to find the appropriate verbs and nouns in the domain. After all, we are talking about domain-specific languages. So if there are already concepts, use those concepts for naming. Um, then there might be conventions already, either Kotlin conventions or conventions um, that are common within a certain type um, of libraries, for example. And then you should follow those conventions as well. So for example, if you're dealing with voice assistants, there's this ask method. If the user says something, then the voice assistant answers and um, expect another input later on. And there's this tell method. If the voice assistant answers and finishes the uh, action or the skill. So you should not name your, uh, your method differently. You should use ask and tell because the user expect that if you use a DSL, use ask, for example. So it boils down to this. Don't be clever, be intuitive. Uh, do something that the client expects from your library, from your DSL. So finally, how is all this done? How can you use features of the Kotlin language to create a DSL? And it turns out that it's uh, just a bunch of normal Kotlin constructs that we all probably use on a daily basis um, that help us to create a DSL. So uh, I'm using some examples from uh, libraries that offer a DSL to show these concepts. So first is mock, which allows you to create mock objects for your tests. And I'm interested in this just runs. And especially for now, I'm interested in what this just method does. And it's just a normal method, <coughs> but it's an infix method. So this allows us to separate um, the object we're acting on, the method name, and the parameters. So, so that you um, can space them out. So without an infix notation, we would have to use something like this. We would have to use the dot, the method name, and then the parenthesis for the arguments. With the infix, uh, if with the infix keyword added, we can uh, replace those, remove those parentheses and replace the dot. So by this, it looks a bit more like a normal language. So this can be handy. So the first concept is infix calls. Again, the same sample, but this time I'm not interested in what just does and how does this works. It's the interesting part here is runs. And it turns out that runs is just an empty object. There is nothing to it, no members, no uh, methods, no functions, nothing. It's just a normal uh, object, empty object that is just created to allow you to use this syntax. And there's even a type alias defined here. So because normally types are with uppercase R, we can also use a type here with lowercase R. And really the only reason this was created was to make this infix call possible. Without that, um, the mock, uh, the use of mock library would have to look like dot just runs as one method with empty parentheses. So <coughs> we have covered empty object and type aliases now. So let's return to Kotlin test. You've seen the sample initially. Um, at the top you see it's a should spec class 
So I want to use this, uh, um, this specific type of um, um, testing style. As they offer different testing styles. And so should, so just one, and then you can use the should method if you're within the context of a should spec class. And um, what actually is this? This is probably the most common example because it's just a trailing lambda. So we have this function passed in here, and this function is then passed on somewhere else, and eventually um, <coughs> the library ex uh, executes all the tests that are available. But if we hadn't you had the trailing lambdas, it would look like this. We would have to write this comma first, then the lambda, and then the closing parentheses. And without that, it looks so much better, in my opinion, especially in the context of DSLs. I think trailing lambdas are nice everywhere, but especially in the context of DSLs, they are so much um, more useful. So, these are trailing lambdas. Now let's return to this uh, example. And I already mentioned they have different testing styles. <coughs> the other style is that you have a strings pack and whether you name it should do something or whatever you want, you can just create a string and then execute a method on it pass the training lambda to the string. So for me as a Java developer, I've been doing Java for nearly 20 years. This looked totally weird initially when I saw something like this. And, but if you dig into it, it's also um, pretty easy to understand and a nice feature of the Kotlin language designers. So it turns out that there is a convention that um, there is this invoke function and if you have this invoke function within your class, then you can pass a lambda to the class, so to speak, and this invoke function is then in invoked with the lambda as parameter. And in this case, um, it's not actually part of a class, it's, uh, it's using the extension function possibility to make it a member of the class string. So also something that is a bit weird for Java developers, string being final. Um, so this Kotlin string is not final and you can uh, at least do extension function on that and then have this invoke method and when you pass a lambda to an object of type string, this method is executed. So <coughs> what we've seen now was first extension functions and that we have conventions that uh, allow us or that we can make use of when we create DSLs. So we have already seen Kotlin uh, HTML <coughs> in an earlier sample. Um, and I think this is a very good example for DSLs because you're, with HTML you're creating really deeply nested object graphs. And uh, as you have seen, you can make use uh, of this normal language features often for, because it's an internal DSL so that you can uh, call other methods that create parts of uh, of your HTML, but there's something that, uh, some concept that I haven't found so far in other libraries, but maybe they uh, <coughs> also use this. And this is this, is this plus, this uh, initial plus before the um, text to um, add a string to a tag. So in HTML, you can add strings to tons of tags uh, nearly everywhere, and so, in this case, it's added to the div tag here. And how is this implemented? It's again an extension function, but the important part here is that a certain kind of operator has been overridden, and it's the uh, unary plus operator here, and this unary plus then is where you write first the plus, and then the object you want to deal on. So it's the other way around than normally. Normally you have first the object and then the method. With a unary plus you have first kind of the method and then the object. So that's operator overloading and just let's go back here. 
if we, uh, if we didn't have this uh, conventions of operator overloading, then we would have something, would have to have something like add and then uh, um, in parentheses the string. So which style is better? It depends on you. Um, I personally don't like this. I, it looks unfamiliar to me. And just because of that, I don't like it, but it's a style that is available. So decide for yourself uh, whether you like it or not but it's available and you can use it when you want to create a DSL. So that was operator overloading and of course there are many other operators that you can uh, overwrite in Kotlin and that might be useful within your uh, DSL or API in general. So <coughs> the final example, no not the final, the second last example is um, for training lambdas with receivers. So we already had training lambdas, but uh, training lambdas with receivers are a tiny bit different. So in this case, this application context is a method that takes a training lambda with a receiver. So what is this? At the top, you see this context dot parenthesis, and uh, it goes over to your unit. So it's obviously a method that takes nothing and returns unit. And uh, this definition uh, of the function looks a bit weird, uh, at least initially, unless you're very, uh, uh, very accustomed to it. And you can think of this as a local extension function. So you, in this case, the extension function is on the type co context, and the name of the extension function is in it. But the name moved from kind of here to here because uh, we also need a name for the method parameter. So we use it just in one place. And so it's a local extension function that is named in it. And now let's see what is going on here. Um, let's unwrap this code a bit to make it more easy to understand. So at first, <coughs> We are creating the context, we're creating a new context, and then we call this extension function on this newly created object, and finally ret return this newly created object. And that is what is happening here within the apply context. And so the lambda that is passed in is executed, sorry, is executed when this method is called. So just go back here. So <coughs> application context is the method that is called and everything within those uh, curly brackets that is passed and is executed when this init method is called. Um, I repeat it so often with this init method because that was something that I initially totally didn't understand. And uh, so to make it more obvious um, and to prevent you from not understanding it like I did initially, I repeat it so often. So, since lambdas with receivers, oh, this is actually uh, wrong. It should be, oh no, it's trailing lambdas versus trailing lambdas with receivers. To uh, make this difference between those two a bit more obvious for those that are not already familiar with this concept, I've used those two uh, standard functions. The first is also that can be applied to any type and uh, can be used, can be passed a trailing lambda to. And the other is the apply function that is also uh, an extension function on any kind of object and uh, that is passed this lambda to. And as you can see, the difference is in how you access the initial object, in this case, just the string hey ho. In the first example, this uh, initial, this object, hey ho, is passed in with the name of it. And in the second, um, in the second sample, hey ho, uh, this apply or this inner, the lambda actually runs in the context of the object hey ho. And so you can access the object hey ho as this, obviously. So let's see a slightly simplified uh, 
explanation of how these methods are defined. This con uh, what is it? This constraint is missing. Um, and you see both extend the type T, so they work on any object. And with the first, the block um, takes a parameter of T and then it returns unit. And in the second part, um, the block is an extension of the type T. So this is uh, the difference. And then in the first part, of course, you would have to pass the object to the lambda and it whereas this is not necessary in the second example because you're already running within the context of this uh, path parameter. And luckily our IDEs help us to understand this even a bit better uh, in Android Studio and IntelliJ and uh, if you use Kotlin and CLI and whatever um, as well, then you um, see of what type this parameter is and whether you can access it as this or at whether you have to access it as if it, for example. And this is very handy if you have a deeper object hierarchy, um, like this is uh, Anko again, and uh, with deeply nested object graphs, uh, it's pretty obvious uh, what is happening here. And as you can see, they're making use of lambdas with receivers a lot in this library because we have all this, this, and then constraint set builder, on this view constraints builder, and things like that. If it weren't uh, numbers with receiver, it would be it, and so on. So this was the concept lambda with receivers, and this is um, probably for DSLs the most important concept, and it's, um, unless you're already familiar with it, it's a bit, mm, you, well, you need maybe a tiny little time till you get used to it, but when you get used to it, um, it comes in handy in lots of places, not only in the context of DSLs, but you can use it um, in all kinds of uh, places to make um, an API more readable and more, um, more easy to use. But if we um, use those um, trading lambdas with receivers, we have one problem, and that is that this, this, the keyword this, um, we can kind of refer to multiple objects. And um, so it's um, possible to inadvertently refer to an object of an outer context that doesn't make uh, sense within the inner context. So, um, just imagine that in this example, for example, the constraint layout had uh, a certain method that you don't can or cannot usefully use uh, on a text view. And uh, then within the inner part, you could still use uh, this method. And if it is kind of named like something that could be useful from the name here uh, within this context, um, it's easy to misuse your library. And as I sh stated initially, you should always strive to make misuse as hard as possible. So the Kotlin designers got us covered here as well, but only since uh, Kotlin 1.1, when they introduced um, a DSL marker. And this DSL marker limits the scope of this, you can still access the outer scope by this at whatever, but um, you cannot use uh, a method of the outer scope um, without intending to do so. So inadvertently, misuse is hard, but you still, still can access everything that you want to access. So if you want to limit the scope to just one level down, then you uh, have to create this, um, uh, this annotation. And this annotation, then again, is an annotation that is annotated with DSL marker. So scope limiting is something that they introduced with uh, Kotlin 1.1, and that is very important, and uh, you should 
think about it when creating your API to prevent uh, misuse of uh, methods that shouldn't be available or shouldn't be used in, with in the inner context. So when designing DSLs, there is uh, something more to um, take into consi consideration. And that is um, that you might have, or that it might be um, advisable to deviate from normal naming conventions. So normally, um, for example, all methods start with a lower case letter, and then we have this camel case notation. Um, within the uh, router DSL of Spring, they deviate from that. They have, uh, so um, the Spring router library um, allows us to create backends and to deal with incoming HTTP traffic. So incoming HTTP methods or incoming HTTP traffic can be of a certain type. There are different HTTP methods available. So get, post, we have seen them already today as well. And uh, those HTTP methods are normally always written in all uppercase letters. So in the router DSL that you can use to deal with this incoming HTTP traffic, they also use method names that are all uppercase. So an all uppercase get, for example, or all uppercase post, for example. And it makes sense if you're using this DSL to create uh, your router definitions and to define what handler should react to what kind of incoming request, it's easily readable or easily spotable for what kind of requests what handler is used. And you see, okay, so a put is incoming, and I see this put, because it's all uppercase, it's even more glaring, and it's uh, really easily spotable. So consider deviating, and we have already seen this with, um, with runs, um, which is just a type, an empty type in this case, but it was, uh, there was this type alias that provided us with a lowercase letter. So also for objects, it might be helpful. You have to think from the user perspective again, and you have to think of uh, what is common within the domain. Um, then again, <coughs> all those concepts are pretty nice and allow us to create a uh, DSL more or less easily. But mm, if something can easily be done, you um, might want to use all this stuff. And it's very easy to go overboard and um, use all kinds of useful concepts, even though they are not really useful in this certain kind, um, for this certain kind of usage. And it's very important to um, restrain yourself and think, is this really useful? Is this really helping the user of my uh, API or not? Um, for example, with this empty objects again, Kotlin test initially also used empty objects. And as far as I know, they don't use them anymore. They uh, have changed uh, their DSL. And um, so they probably thought, okay, this is a bit too weird and too much and don't use it. There is this nice uh, repo that uh, discusses some of those approaches uh, I've shown today and also discuss discusses what is useful and what is probably not useful and the creator of this repo is actually here in the audience. And um, just visit this repo, I really can recommend it. Um, this readme gives you a short but nice uh, discussion of uh, what to use and what might not be as useful. And um, the creator also implemented everything so th um, that you can, uh, if you want to revisit those concepts after this talk, I don't have to create a repo myself. It's all there, <laughs> yeah, all done by, uh, yes, I don't even know what this ZSMB stands for, but by this nice guy in the green T-shirt here. <laughs> so, now another question to ask yourself is, when actually is something a DSL? 
And that is hard to tell. There is no hard and fast rule where you can say, okay, this is a DSL and this is none. And um, I think it might not even be the important question to ask whether you should create a DSL. The important question, of course, is to create something that is useful for your API client. So if your API and your domain and so on um, easily lends itself to, a, to create a DSL, then by all means, create one. If not, well, just create a normal, nice API. Um, so in one book about Java APIs, uh, API design actually, about API design, that happened to use Java as example, um, there is was written that every fluent interface would be a DSL. So really, I don't think so. Just every fluent interface is a string builder API which has a fluent interface. Is this really a DSL? In my opinion, not, because it's uh, basically just a bunch of overloaded add methods, and the concept itself is not really complex enough, in my opinion, to speak of DSL. It's still a nice, or, or quite a nice <laughs> way to create strings, but um, it's not a DSL, sorry. And um, if you're losing the Android Kaplan extensions, <coughs> they have something to make it easier to deal with the shared preferences. And um, in one place, they're using um, trailing lambdas with receivers. And this is a good choice in, the, in this example for that use case. But uh, what they are creating there, in my opinion, is not really a DSL. It just happens to be a nice way to create your shared preferences. And why do I think that it's not really a DSL? It's because the domain is missing, because, uh, or at least the domain is not complex enough. The uh, domain should offer a lot of concepts so that it makes sense to create a DSL and to speak of a DSL. And there should be a language. Without a language, it's no DSL. So it boils down to that. No DSL without a domain and no DSL without a language. You just have this le S left there. <coughs> Another question you should ask yourself is whether it's worth it. So if you're using a library or you're, you're looking for a library, let's put it like that. You're looking for a library, for example, for loading images in Android. And you have multiple choices for libraries and all of those libraries fulfill your needs or at least let's say three of those libraries fulfill your needs. But only one offers a reasonable DSL. In my opinion, as a client, the choice would be easy. In this case, mm, if there is a DSL, it makes the code that much more readable, and as such, as a client, uh, if there is a DSL, you should, you kind of should use it. So the question for now, the client, it's not easy, definitely use it. Now for the provider part, so if you're providing a library and you're creating an API, should you really create it? And um, this depends on many factors. Um, all in all, of course, creating a DSL, you have to think about the language and, uh, and about all these concepts. And um, it is more work to create a DSL than, say, a normal API, even though a normal API should also be nicely designed. It shouldn't be just written down. But even so, it's more work to create a proper DSL. So you have to ask yourself when it's useful. So if you're uh, working in an in-house project and um, you have some kind of concepts that would allow uh, or that would make sense to create a DSL, then the question is how often is this code used? How often is, um, is the use changed? So uh, keep in mind, a DSL helps you to make your intention obvious. So when you return to the code, to the DSL later on, you immediately grasp what is happening here, there. And 
if you don't return often to this part of the code, then this benefit is just not um, big enough to justify the additional work for you to create a DSL. So for internal projects, um, or if you happen to work alone on your projects, a DSL only makes sense if you're revisiting this part very often and have to make changes to it often enough. It's very different if you're creating an external uh, API. So if you're creating a library, then as I already mentioned, I personally would look whether this library provides a DSL and if it provides one, this could sway those clients to use your library. And after all, you're publishing the library because you want others to use your library and you want to get feedback for the library, you want others to contribute to the library. And so the larger the user base, um, the better for you as well. So in this case, as a provider, then if you publish a library, it can make sense. And uh, in this case, it boils down to the question, if it makes the life of your client easier, is there something that you can create so that the code is that much better readable afterwards? And if so, yes, a DSL makes sense. So, <clears throat> let's summarize what we've seen so far. The important part of every DSL is to make the intention of the code obvious, and that is the benefits of why we're using DSLs and uh, why the Kotlin creators introduced those nice concepts that happen to uh, help us with DSLs or that were specifically added to make DSLs easy to create. All in all, they are made up of simple concepts that we're using in all, uh, all kind of projects anyway. And you have to decide whether to use those concepts um, within the DSL or just for normal use. And of course, and that is really important, your DSL has to be designed. You have to properly construct it so that it's really um, helping your client. It's, it's really adding um, yeah, adding a benefit to your client. If not, then your client doesn't, uh, well, then it's not worth it. And you always have to use the client usage function center. That is really important. And of course, it must be worth it. Should normally is worth it for the client, but it also must be worth it for you because you have uh, the higher initial um, workload to uh, provide. So, and with this, um, I'm done with the talk. So, are there any questions? The mic is not there yet. I guess it will come around anyway. So, any questions? Okay, you can state your question and I repeat the question. Uh, so the question was whether I have some suggestions for additional features in Kotlin that would make writing uh, DSLs easier, right? No, <laughs> I, I don't have them. They are surely there. Um, I, uh, there are many languages that support DSLs. Groovy does, Scala does, and uh, many non-JVM languages as well. Um, but um, since I'm really mostly interested in DSLs in the Kotlin uh, space. I'm not as familiar with them um, to uh, really have any useful thing to say to the uh, JetBrains team. But there surely are something, and uh, I guess the JetBrains team is thinking about those things that other languages allow, but um, I cannot, uh, I cannot uh, demand a certain feature. Let's put it like that. Other questions? <coughs> 
Thank you, really nice talk. Um, I'm not familiar with uh, DSL, but uh, I would like to ask that how typical that you have to rewrite these libraries to um, if the domain problem changes, so you have to refresh the language or, or is it typical thing to do? So <coughs> if the domain changes, I think that's um, not that common, that the domain in itself changes, even if it's something like I image loading in uh, Android, routing uh, of HTTP traffic and stuff like that. Um, it should be something that um, remains more or less um, the same over time. Um, but when you design a DSL, something I <coughs> didn't mention yet, but thankfully can add now, um, you should, uh, in your first version, you're bound to make things wrong. Uh, someone has written the first version is always, always the easy one, but then problems start popping up. And um, so you should expose as little as necessary, as you think necessary um, in your initial version. So because, as I mentioned, you cannot take features back because of the users. But um, you probably won't cover everything in your first version, so you might want to uh, add on that, depending on client demands or your own demands on that. So um, y your DSL is also probably growing over time. Mm, I don't think that the um, domain usually changes in ways so that some concepts have to be removed, for example. Maybe something has to be rewritten, but since um, the naming should come from the domain itself. This also shouldn't happen very often. But let's take the um, spring routing example. Maybe uh, with HTTP2, probably many concepts are very different from uh, HTTP 1.1 that we have currently. And so it could be that they have to add many things to uh, support HTTP2 as well. I'm not familiar enough to, with HTTP2. I just know that it's a binary protocol, and, and as such, it's a bit different. And so I expect the Spring Router DSL um, to change um, as well when they want to support that. But um, in this case, it's just an addition and not really. So the old part, so as long as HTTP 1.1 1, 1 .1 is relevant, the old part will stay relevant as well. Okay, did this answer? Yes, sir, thank you. Other questions? Okay, there are no more questions, then enjoy the rest of the conference. Thanks.